reflection from my standpoint as a philosophy professor. This is some reflection that's based on the unproven assumption that I have something to add to the conversation. My subject matter today is Sri Lanka. My knowledge level is that of a novice. I know almost nothing. Why? Mainstream media doesn't cover it. Why? Don't I know anything about it? Because without some conceptual framework for understanding, I'm not going to have anything that alerts me to what's important about it. So, here's my first reflection. Um, ignorance follows the physical law of inertia. A mind in ignorance tends to stay in ignorance, including my own. But I want to get out of that, so I'll ask ready to move on to the next slide. Where, like inertia, like physical inertia, the status will remain constant until an external agent or the, some other event disrupts the continuation. And the event that disrupts the continuation of my ignorance relative to what happened in Sri Lanka in 2009 is genocide. Because I was one of those Jewish kids, and genocide was a part of every story that I heard growing up in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s in Skokie, how it was our people who took it on the chin. No, it is everybody's people that's been taking it on the chin for a heck of a long time. But I still wake up to genocide. So, next. I got a little bit of information from the BBC. Why would I have to go to the BBC? Because, point one, American media doesn't cover Sri Lanka. They don't apparently consider it very important. Now, I'm going to stop a minute before I get on to my actual tale about genocide and read off the news. April 3rd, 2013, a papal newspaper called Upayan was attacked in northern Sri Lanka. Masked men in northern Sri Lanka have attacked the offices of the Tamil newspaper and beaten its staff. Well, that sounds like one of those things that Ray was talking about. You don't just walk in and start beating people up random. The owner of the pro-opposition to play on paper said that six masked men entered the building in Kilinochi before dawn. Two members of the staff were badly injured and property damaged. It's the fourth time that Tamil language newspapers or the distributors were attacked in Sri Lanka. This was back in April in 2013. So there have been more than four such attacks. This particular attack happened in Jaffna. No, it happened further south in Jaffna when the local distribution copies of the paper had come in. Uh, the six men had been shouting something in Sinhala, the majority language of Sri Lanka, and they were waving cricket stumps. And for Americans who don't understand cricket, that's like a baseball bat. In the office, the manager was sitting on the floor and they hammered him. Mr. Saravana Pavan told BBC another boy was badly hit and he needs stitches between his ear and his jaw. The office buildings and the vehicle were damaged. Police took statements and fingerprints but hadn't found anything. As typically happens. When you have a majority government being led by a majority and you're in trying to salvage that which a minority owns. Now, let's move on. Here's reflection number two, some things that I've learned. Somebody over in Sri Lanka doesn't want people to get the news, particularly if it's published by the opposition, which is to say the government don't want to let the news out. That sounds a lot like other places I've lived. And I've always been here. <laughs> Whoever wants to keep the news from
from being reported, in this case, speaks Xin Hao. Pretty good clue. Saro Vanapan, uh, that's the name of the owner of the newspaper, must be speaking something else. So I know that there's at least two languages going on in Sri Lanka. A little bit more research Next. from Genocide Watch tells me that there have been some attempts to issue a UN internal review report. Such attempts were blocked at the UN by the ambassador from Sri Lanka, who is Sinhala and in the majority view of the government. The Black Report would have mentioned the killing of 70,000 Tamil civilians at the end of the 2009 Civil War. The government of Sri Lanka doesn't like the idea of the United Nations Higher Human Rights Commission recommending that it ensure justice and accountability in the aftermath of the war. This is the little that I've known. So here's my new concept of Sri Lanka. I don't, still don't know much, remaining the novice that I am, but I know that this place with two people speaking two languages and not all that fond of each other. I know that it's a place where the opposition news is censored in a style that looks like gangster land in Chicago in the 1930s. I know that it's a place where a 26-year-long war for independence was declared won by the Sinhala majority government side, uh, and the defeated rebels are known as Tamil. I know that it's a place that the United Nations Human Rights Commission believes should be investigated for human rights abuses and genocide in the last five months of the war. I know that much. So just to provide people with a few things, I put together a little bit of a timeline. It goes all the way back to almost the beginning of time in 6th century BC when the Sinhalese arrived. Uh, it took until the 13th century before the Tamil, AD, before the Tamil arrived. They didn't get there as fast. They moved in from a province of India called Tamil Nadu, I think it's called. Tamil Nadu, but Tamil also came in BC. They also came in BC. BC. See, I, I, I maintain my ignorance. Yeah, no, that is coming from one side of the city. Okay, this is all coming from one side. One side. Uh, going from the other side. At any rate, I got to see that it was kind of controlled, yeah, that's kind, of, kind of controlled by uh, some of the colonial powers, initially Portugal, the Netherlands, and eventually Britain, who took over everything and ruled as they often did with an iron fist. Uh, probably the most cooperation that existed between Sinhalese and Tamils was about getting the British out. 1948 was independence. It arose mostly because England was too broke to actually enforce its laws in the place and decided to scrap. In 1972, the name was changed, and then there were some atrocities reputed on either side that led to a war of independence in 1983 that was ended, at least formally, in 2009. And since then, Tamil representatives have cited mob violence as one tool that's being used very extensively by Sinhala to try to make sure that they don't get a voice in government or any of the decision making. That's about it for the little I know. Next is my third reflection. Ready told me to reflect on three things. So I went back on this and just picked up a couple of lines from that and said the British had control of it until 1948 and they messed up in 1947 big time in Pakistan and India where they had managed to get people to all live in all kinds of different places and then swarms of them had to get back out into the proper country in order to deal with the religion that they had adopted. Creating a ton of confusion and an awful lot of death and violence. 
When they came to Ceylon, Sri Lanka, they were equally inept. Leading the Tamil to eventually decide to hold the War of Independence and try to break away from the Sahara, moving mostly into provinces in the North and East. So my reflection is, does breaking away from an empire risk an enormous population displacement? Or is it just that colonization is so bad a system that eventually it's going to keep on going? And did World War II really end, or did it just get passed down to the colonies? And I'm done. Next.